Good evening, everybody. Boa noite, Brasil. Uh, buenas noches a toda América Latina. Uh, on behalf of Investing Latam, it is a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this new edition of Conversations with Victor Munoz. Uh, tonight, we have a very, very special guest, uh, Caio David, CEO from Itaú BBA. Uh, of course, Itaú doesn't need much of an introduction as the largest bank in Latin America, and certainly global presence, uh, and it's a story in the making now for more than 90 years. Um, what I'd like to say about Caio is, uh, ever since I met him and heard about his, his story, is uh, it's just impressive. Caio entered the bank as a trainee and worked his way up through the years, all the way to becoming the CEO of uh, the investment bank, that will be VA. Um, he is an MBA from NYU and a mechanical engineer. Uh, Caio, welcome tonight to this conversation. Victor, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for this opportunity. And of course, thank you for these kind of words. I really appreciate <laughs> You more than, than deserve them. Um, let's, uh, let's talk first a little bit about the obvious situation. This crisis of the COVID-19 uh, is really a global crisis, not a global, it's not a local situation, it's really a global cri crisis. Uh, openly, how do you see the situation? Well, Victor, um, I would say that this crisis is, is different from uh, the others, very different from the others. First of all, because it is a, a crisis related to public health. And uh, if we compare with the 2008 crisis, which was pretty much fundamentally financial, then you see a huge difference. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, when you talk about a global pandemic, uh, that's another issue because we are, we are thinking about all sectors suffering at the same time globally the effects of a slowdown in the economy. So uh, based on that fact, I would say that uh, we have a lot of challenges ahead. And I remember uh, in January when we were discussing uh, in some meetings uh, in the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, two main hot topics, I would say. The first was the climate change, sustainability and so on. And the second one was about economic growth. And then uh, the question was if uh, the world would grow above 3% or not. What happened just three months later is that we are going to face a recession of 3% in 2020. So it is this unimaginable. It is like, you know, uh, something that uh, we would not expect even when we run those very stress uh, scenarios in our business. So something unthinkable like that. So uh, it's going to be uh, different from the others. And um, we, for sure, are going to face a lot of challenges ahead. Um, completely agree with that, uh, and uh, it is in a way unfortunate, um, but uh, it also hopefully will generate some good things as well out of all this. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the reaction, the response of the bank to the crisis now, specifically at an institutional level. Well, um, it's uh, it's important to mention. Um, three elements that uh, the bank has an, an strategy and um, those elements are key to understand where we are right now. First of all, the bank has a very strong corporate governance and a very strong risk culture. And that means that based on, on, on those things, we were able to define very well responsibilities we can define very well limits and policies and not only for brazil actually that framework uh, is basic on on the understanding of the whole region and how we should operate all units in latin america so that first element is, is really important and uh, the way we manage the crisis uh, is based on those um, those uh, strong um, corporate governance and, um, uh, and the risk culture. 
The second mm -hmm. element uh, I would highlight is the risk appetite of the bank, which means the board of directors define um, metrics as a way uh, to uh, better manage uh, the risks involved in, in our operations. And uh, I would highlight two, two main metrics here, uh, which were key to manage this crisis as well. Those are liquidity and capital. So based on uh, the, the parameters that we, we, we manage the bank, uh, we were able to attend our clients even a situation like this, because we have high level of liquidity and high level of capital. And I guess the third uh, point that I would highlight is that for the case, the bank has been able to invest a lot on technology. And technology has been the main driver here to support our business during this crisis. So we are talking about, you know, digital channels, uh, remote uh, meetings, and um, virtual, you know, interactions. So uh, we really uh, have been able to attend our clients during this period uh, with uh, no lockdown and, and some other measures um, throughout the region to support better our clients based on, on, on those technologies. So I would say that uh, those three elements uh, um, have been uh, extremely important to help us uh, to go through this crisis um, in, in a way that we can uh, provide support to our clients. So overall, um, those are the pillars and uh, we have seen a lot of you know, change in the way we operate. We prepare home office for more than 50,000 people, which, which is something. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, 30,000 people um, were uh, with new notebooks in, in about a week uh, at home. So it was wow. quite impressive the way we, we, we manage uh, the support to our uh, employees to, to run the bank like this. And of course, there is another piece, a very important piece that I mentioned is about client. So here uh, we have been able to support them uh, in, in, in their needs. Uh, which are pretty much related to the cash flow imbalances that they are facing in a way to you know, you know bring more uh, tranquility uh, to them uh, to go through this, this uh, very tough moment. So those are uh, the pillars that I would like to mention uh, in terms of what we are doing here based on the, the three elements that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, there's many actions of the bank that uh, have caught my eye, but just one especially that I need to bring up. Um, the bank made the largest private donation ever, at least in Brazil. And oh, sorry about this. And, and, and we're talking about a donation of 1 billion reais. But here, of course, it's the huge size of the donation. But the other is um, the way that you guys are making sure that it actually gets where it should be and it has the largest impact. You, you guys not only make the donation, but also put together a committee that is going to manage that money, a committee led by the uh, general director of the Sirio Libanese Hospital, one of the most reputable hospitals in, in Brazil and Latin America. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. How do you guys get to that? How do you guys do it? Because I think it's a very, very interesting example. I guess... We do have um, our responsibility uh, here in Brazil, not only because of our size, our relevance to the financial um, sector, but also because uh, we have other ways to contribute to a crisis like this, not only providing liquidity and managing uh, credit to our clients, but also trying to figure out ways uh, to support uh, the health system um, uh, somehow. So the idea came from the board of directors as a way to, you know, um, give, give some uh, contribution from the private sector uh, in this very difficult moment uh, for the, the public health in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So uh, we invited uh, a group of, you know, distinguished um, healthy uh, specialists um, 
who are the 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 managers of those investments and uh, we have been able to to uh, address uh, key issues in brazil because of their contribution in terms of um, allocation and uh, we are quite happy with this in three weeks just to, to to give an idea we were able to allocate more than uh, 800 million reais already uh, so uh, from you know field hospitals to equipments and so on so we are quite happy with this and uh, i believe that that's part of our you know contribution to the crisis uh, which is quite important yeah um in in that same line um i completely agree with you uh, and actually about a 45 days or 30 days ago i would have thought that we were going to have some kind of v-shaped recovery but uh, I guess it has dawned on all of us that it's not going to be like that, and that we really have a long and uh, winding road ahead of us. Uh, how can the financial sector, not just Itaú, but the financial sector as a whole, help lead the way through that difficult road that lies ahead? How can the financial sector help the economy get back in its feet faster? How can the financial sector <clears throat> help consumption, how the financial sector can help people. How, how do you see the role, uh, the social role uh, in this moment of crisis? This is quite important. And uh, when you talk about donation, we are talking about social responsibility and uh, how we can um, better play our role in the overall um, country. So here, the first thing uh, which is quite important it is, is the soundness of the financial system. So um, if you have a, a very you know, um, reliable uh, financial system uh, with uh, banks well capitalized, then uh, banks started to, to play an important role in terms of being part of the solution and not adding uh, an issue uh, to the crisis uh, because of any you know uh, difficulty in terms of capital and so on so um, being part of the solution then uh, we can help a lot um, this uh, very important social uh, issue that we are facing so just to give an idea we're providing new credit lines to our clients we are renegotiating we are roll rolling out uh, also uh, some debts so those are measures to um, help our clients to go through this, this crisis with a better, better balance in their cash flows. Uh, those are very important measures. And uh, I would say that the central banks, not only in Brazil, but also in Latin America, have been done a great job in terms of providing liquidity and uh, helping banks uh, to support their clients to, to new credit lines and so on. Uh, which are quite important uh, in this moment. So having a, a very healthy financial system is key uh, to, to bring them, uh, all those banks, to, to a different level of contribution in, in this moment. Okay. Um, very well. Let's, um, let's move to a, a next topic, perhaps, um, something a little bit more technical. Um, what is the credit situation overall right now? And this has at least three dimensions. One is, what is the situation of corporates, medium-sized and small companies? Second dimension is, how prepared is the financial system in Brazil and in other countries, quite frankly, not just Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Peru, to cope with the situation? And the third dimension is, what are governments doing? What can they do to help at this moment? That's a good question. Uh, talking first about the, the credit portfolio here at the bank. Um, that's another part of this strategy. Uh, we have a very diversified portfolio, which means less concentration uh, by sector, by single names and so on. So uh, that helps a lot. Uh, when you face a situation like this, where the delinquency rate, delinquency rate will go up for sure 
and all those segments that you, you mentioned, uh, individuals, small and medium-sized companies, and also uh, corporations. So uh, the way we see it is, is that we have been able to manage uh, the credit portfolio in a way, as I mentioned, or spawn installments and so on. And um, the impact of the social distancing and the lockdown initiatives here in Brazil and in all countries uh, in Latin America as well, have brought um, a slowdown in economic activity, which is, um, I would say, um, extremely uh, sensible in terms of the credit portfolio of the banks. So we are trying to manage those uh, impacts, uh, giving a time and uh, giving uh, ways of you know refinancing uh, those credits as a way to support our clients here what is important to mention is is that um overall i would say that the, sec the financial sector is, is is very prepared to cope with this situation you know? so first of all i would say that the, we are entering this crisis uh, in a much better shape than before than a previous crisis why is that? Well, first of all, in Brazil, for instance, we have been uh, recovering uh, quite well from the last recession, which uh, took place in 2015 and 16. So here, um, the banks are, are quite solid and um, the banks were growing and expanding business. They were diversifying revenues. They apply uh, efficiency programs. Uh, so those are measures that help a lot a bank like ourselves to go through this crisis uh, in a better way to you know, contribute to the, to the whole system. So um, those are key elements here to uh, allow us to go deeper uh, in this contribution. It is important to mention here in Brazil that another important uh, variable is related to the interest rates. So we do have right now the lowest level ever uh, in Brazil, which helps a lot uh, when you're talking about that restructuring and, and from, from individuals and, and also from, from corporates. So overall, I'm confident that uh, the financial sector uh, will continue to play an important role, not only in Brazil, but also in, in, in other countries as a way uh, to go through this crisis as it moves as possible. Oh. And uh, go ahead. No, no, I, I was uh, I was about to say that. Um, um, do you see any main differences between or among the South American Latin American countries where you have a presence, or in one, then you might be more concerned about one thing that than other. Um, we do have some differences among them. Uh, I would say that uh, Peru and Chile are in, in a better situation, especially because uh, if you take into consideration uh, the net debt to GDP, so they are running about you know 10 percent or more or less. So it, it is a different situation from what we are seeing in Brazil and Argentina, and. Um, Colombia as well. Talking about Argentina, um, besides managing the crisis, they are in the middle of a, a restructuring process in, in their death. So uh, it, it complicates a little bit because um, there is limited access to, to international resources. And um, when we talk about Colombia, maybe um, oil prices uh, are putting some pressures um, on, 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 on its situation, but I guess with the, with the prices above uh, $30, which is pretty much what you're seeing right now, that might help um, to, to manage uh, this situation. But uh, I would add uh, that Brazil has you know, um, a GDP um, retraction, uh, which impacts our you know, uh, debt to GDP. Uh, we are running about no 80% or so right now. 
And uh, we are trying to bring some relief to that ratio, but um, with the fiscal stimulus that we are seeing right now, provided by the government, then um, it will take longer to, to see a better performance in terms of our fiscal balance. So um, I see different situations uh, in countries in Latin America, uh, each one facing different you know, challenges, but overall, uh, the measures and policies of uh, governments um, have been pretty much the same, which means providing liquidity to the, to the financial sector, helping uh, those less favorable uh, individuals, and uh, trying to uh, bring some recovery of the economy in 2021. And they are hoping that it's going to be in a, in a V shape. But let's see, Victor. Okay. Um, when we started the crisis uh, 60 days ago, basically, we started to say, okay, you know, maybe GDP is going to be around zero. Then we said, no, no, it's going to be negative. And we said, no, maybe negative 2%. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were already saying negative 5%. Uh, and so on and so forth. I even heard two or three days ago somebody saying that it could get in Brazil to double digits negative. Uh, and of course, the impact in Colombia, in Chile, is also going to be important, although it seems that those two economies uh, are a little bit more resilient. Uh, resilient is that it might be negative three, five percent. Um, do you think really that in Brazil can get to a double digit negative growth? Um, yeah. Nowadays, I believe the range is somehow between 4.5, which is our figure from our macro team, and um, 7%. Okay. But, you know, uh, it all depends on the extent of the crisis. And um, so those uh, numbers uh, are being reviewed uh, every week. So let's follow closely. Um, oh. It is difficult to say what, what's going to be the end of this. Okay. Um, let's get out a little bit of the crisis now. Let's talk about all, all the things. Now, one of the uh, trends that was already uh, in place before the crisis has been digitalization. Uh, of course, with the crisis, we all have been forced to become more digital, and there's no, no, no argument about that. But... Um, the bank, uh, as a long-standing institution, it has different strengths. One of them, I believe, is the, the local presence, the huge presence that the bank has in the countries, and in Brazil particularly, all over the place, in a country that is uh, continental size. Uh, however, digitalization argues for uh, perhaps less agencies, a more digital platform. Um, how is the bank thinking about that? What is the trend where you guys want to go and how do you see the landscape in terms of competitors from other large banks that are becoming digital to new 100% or completely digital banks, the kind of banks that do not have agency? How, how do you see all this? I guess there is a trend uh, towards um, digital um, platforms. Uh, so we have been investing a lot in terms of um, bringing the best user experience through digital. And uh, here we are talking about mobile and internet and so on. And uh, that trend uh, is pretty much done. I mean, the new generation is, is the one leading this process because they are the ones um, asking for a different type of relationship with banks. Uh, the way they do banking is quite different. So from there, we are providing not only uh, digital um, services to them, but also we continue to offer uh, services throughout uh, our traditional branches. But in the last um, you know, three, four years, we have been able to reduce the number of branches because our clients are not demanding that much um, that kind of channel. So uh, we are managing uh, this migration to uh, digital uh, based on uh, the demand from our clients. So that's, that's the way we see it. 
During the crisis, what is interesting is that, of course, the number of uh, digital transactions went up by 50%. So, and we have much more uh, clients just operating to, to, to digital. And that's going to be a trend. I mean, that's going to be the way we're going to see uh, the world playing because uh, the experience for, for those clients is much better. It's much easier. Um, and um, I would say that uh, it's part of the strategy of the bank providing that kind of, um, of, of um, service. And we continue to do that. Okay. Um, now, um, i like to um, actually um, move to, to another uh, to another topic, which is um, the post-crisis. As I think about businesses, etc., of course, we all have to be very focused in how to manage things today, well-being of people, home office, operations, etc. But then, I guess we all agree that whatever comes after this is going to be different from what we were living 60, 70 days ago. Um, the question is, how different? Is it going to be radically different? Uh, is it going to be somehow different? Uh, certainly, people are going to be more digital. But are we going to get to the point where you know uh, physical spaces are not needed? People working from home, is it true that you're going to see empty offices all over Faria Lima, here in Sao Paulo, in La Carrera Septima, in Bogota, right? In Golf, in Santiago, you know? Is that going to become a ghost town? Uh, social distancing, I mean, the era of big concerts is gone. Um, cinema, movies, you know, theaters is done. Uh, how do you see that, that future? Because as we think of how that's going to be, we will need as business leaders to prepare for that. So in your case, how are you foreseeing all these changes? How do you see the post uh, crisis scenario. That's a great question, Victor. I'm not so sure if I have an answer to that, but um, the way I see it is that uh, uh, social interaction will change. And um, people learn how to, you know, um, interact in different ways right now. And uh, I believe part of it is going to be the new normal. Uh, in, in those social relationships. Uh, also, uh, home office is going to be part of the um, business. I mean, uh, we are having uh, very good feedbacks from our teams in terms of uh, how good they are, you know, uh, enjoying, uh, how they are enjoying this kind of, you know, um, relationship with clients and, and even with the bank from home. And um, that brings a lot of uh, productivity as well because just to give you an idea, in our um, commercial area, we are interacting three times more with our clients than before. Of course, our clients are also uh, in a, a virtual type of relationship with us. And that helps a lot. And the clients are enjoying because they can decide, they can discuss alternatives for their business in, 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 a, in a faster way uh, with, uh, with a lot of you know, efficiency. So I guess that's going to be part of the, the new norm as well. And um, talking about uh, you know, corporate business, as you mentioned, uh, I have read some papers about uh, Manhattan. So what's going to happen with the, those you know, corporate buildings and um, how they're, they're going to manage uh, the fact that maybe we are not going to have that kind of flow uh, in the island uh, anymore. So things will change for sure. We don't know how deep, uh, how profound they will be, but um, that's for sure. But let me take, <laughs> take advantage, Victor, here and ask you a question, if you allow me. Uh, of course, you're welcome. All right, thank you. Um, how you're seeing as an investor this this situation? I mean, uh, this um, uh, slowdown in the economy in Latin America, and of course, 
how you see the recovery from now on, based on the fact that uh, we uh, we have uh, we have a lot of investments in the region, and, uh, and I, I would appreciate our comment here, I guess. Okay, <laughs> it was not supposed to happen, but uh, <laughs> um, very quickly, um, we first of all, as a reaction of the crisis, we you focus on people and their wealth being. Um, their health, of course, and then obviously the work from home has been a challenge because uh, it's not just to give an order, everybody goes home. I think it's also begin to understand what that means for people. You have a, a wife or a husband who now is at home with the three little kids running around in a small apartment. Do they have the right environment to work or not? And how can we help them? do the work from home. Uh, so that's been, I'd say, number one. And then uh, number two has been focusing a lot on the businesses. And businesses, um, you have some uh, cash generating engines that you need to, to get going, particularly here in Brazil, in the case of uh, our investments in, in renewable energy. We have several wind parks going. We need to make sure that operation and maintenance goes on and they don't stop. Uh, and of course, we have parks as well that are being constructed, etc., to try to help to, to minimize the impact. And then uh, I think in a way, uh, infrastructure will be one of the tools that governments will use to help restart the economy, build roads, uh, to the extent electricity is needed. And here is one of the big differ differences between countries. You know, in Brazil, we have now real, real overcapacity in a way. Uh, I don't know when the new auctions for, for, for electricity will come, etc. We have the case of Colombia where, you know, uh, the level uh, of the water plants is, is very low. It's like around 32%. And if there is an economic retake rather quickly, Colombia might be uh, depressed or restricted for the availability of power. So there might be as well not only the need to, for roads, there might be uh, the, the, the need of electricity, etc. So um, I think that as an investor in infrastructure is something that's a good news. We will have to be looking at and seeing specifically how we can participate in those and help that happen, help, help create employment, help create consumption, etc., etc. Uh, but overall, uh, I'd like to say those things, uh, two things. One, I completely agree with you. The recovery is going to be very long. Um, Yesterday, um, uh, I've heard that, for example, Colombia already announced that there will not be international flights until September 1st. And of course, this is assuming everything goes well. Um, so uh, that only sends you just a message of, uh, of the kind of things that of, of the length of the time we'll have to wait for, for, for some sort of new normal. Uh, however, that, that's going to go. Uh, and the second thing is, yep, I do expect a lot of changes in behavior, in consumption. Uh, I do think, I don't think offices will disappear, but I believe we're going to be way, way more flexible. And look, you want to work from home this morning, do it. You want to leave now and work from home. Um, it's going to be, become more uh, focused on results rather than how many time you spend in an office. Um, but I don't believe that the interaction of people being together in a place as a team can be replaced necessarily by a video. So um, we'll have to see. We'll have to see where, where things go. But um, that's how we see the future and, and the opportunities. So, um, but with that, let me get back uh, on the questions. Thank you. <laughs> and this, uh, particularly um, uh, interesting, I wouldn't say difficult, but, uh, but it's something that we've not stopped to think yet. I think all the governments, and rightly so, are spending a lot of money to help companies, to help people, and will have to spend a lot of money in, in getting the, the economy going. That means uh, deficits. That means debt. Um, and at some point, that will have to be repaid. Does that mean necessarily more taxes? Uh, are there any creative ways in we in which we could start to, to work to, to pay that debt without necessarily increasing taxes that might actually be more, more negative for the recovery of the economy? How do you see that 
paying the bill after the crisis is gone? I would say the, the answer would be a little bit different for each one of those countries. But uh, let's take, take the example of Brazil. So I guess over time, uh, an increase in taxes will be necessary somehow. Uh, and um, fiscal discipline is going to be key uh, as a way to, to, to manage uh, the impact of those things. And uh, we have been discussing a lot about structural reforms in Brazil. And uh, after the COVID, if we do not address those key reforms, then we are not gonna, gonna get a, any uh, uh, opportunity to bring the fiscal deficit down uh, and uh, accommodate uh, or compensate somehow what we are seeing as a public expenditures right now. So that's gonna be a combination of, of, of those things and I believe that um, fiscal discipline uh, you have to be one of the, the key drivers down the road as a way to uh, avoid um, fiscal, even uh, higher fiscal deaths uh, in the coming years. But I would say that we have to go through this first, see uh, how much um, investments uh, will be done to, to support the families and uh, the companies uh, in each one of those countries and then try to figure out the ways to, to bring down uh, this deficit to a reasonable level that would allow us to, to uh, bring sustainable GDP growth um, again to the, the whole region. Okay, thank you very much for, for this time and for sharing your, your opinions and your views uh, with us. Um, people are here to listen to you, to, to your thoughts. Um, to close, uh, I'd like to open space for you to send the message to people in business and to people in general across Latin America uh, about the crisis, about the future. Uh, what would you like to say? To everybody who is listening to us right now. Well, then, well, first of all, thank you for, for the open question because um, I see some takeaways and uh, I would love to, to share with you guys uh, what I have in mind. So it's, it's a great opportunity. So I would say that at the corporate level, uh, what I see as important takeaways is, is the importance of a sound uh, financial system. Um, the importance of investments in technology, as we discussed before, we will, we will not be able to go through this crisis uh, with the lockdown uh, approach uh, without uh, those new technologies um, available to all of us. There is a third thing which is quite important, uh, which is related to communication. So um, not only uh, communication uh, for our clients, but also internal communication. Uh, those things have been uh, key to uh, maintain um, the focus and um, the direction of our business um, somehow. And we are talking about 100,000 employees here. And uh, those talented people uh, have been able to deliver um, an outstanding uh, and all service, uh, even in a situation like this uh, that we, we, we are facing. And um, what is important as well at the corporate level is uh, to have a clear understanding of the new priorities of our clients. Um, the situation changed uh, for them dramatically, as well uh, changed for the financial sector, but. Um, the responsiveness to that has been key uh, to, to maintain um, a good relationship in, in a very dramatic situation. So those are the messages that I, I'm considering uh, at the corporate level. Uh, at the personal level, 
um, I would say that um, we are facing um, difficult times, and uh, I believe everyone is, is um, taking into consideration some uh, reflections about uh, what's going on and about what's next. And uh, I can share with you a, a history um, uh, of our family. So in March, my wife and I contract, uh, you know, coronavirus. And um, I had just mild uh, symptoms, but my wife, uh, you know, uh, was in the hospital for five days. And the situation where you do not, you know, um, have all information because you don't know exactly what is, is, is going to happen with, with the, the virus in this environment and what w would be the right treatment to, to, to you know, fight against it. It's, it's a situation where you have to consider that, um, you know, fragility is, is, is a key component somehow in our lives. So uh, it is important to, to bring some reflection, to, to bring a you know, better balance in our lives. Um, as much as possible and of course a better location of our time because i believe that's uh, our uh, extremely uh, valuable uh, asset that we have to think uh, from now on so thank for the question um once again thank you very much Caio. um i really wanted to do this conversation with you because uh one the bank is, is a great example of corporate management. And I think we really need to have a steady hand at this point in business uh, with all the uncertainty, as you well described, that they're going through. But also, I think the bank um, represents very well the focus on people. And I believe out of this crisis, more and more, uh, we all need to, to really be concerned for people, be more compassionate be more helpful, be a better neighbor. And I believe the bank also embodies uh, those principles. And, and I think that should be one of the things that change in the new future, hopefully, that everybody is more focused on people rather than, uh, than money uh, itself. Um, and finally, um, to end with a positive note, uh, and I am a religious person, um, uh, I hope this quarantine allows all of us to think about ourselves in all the dimensions uh, and that when we go out of the quarantine, we don't go out the same way that we started. Hopefully we go out with stronger, with better purposes, uh, with more energy and that we somehow can use this situation to, to improve. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for, for all your, your opinions, very valuable. And uh, I hope that we can have you here again uh, in the future uh, at some point. Thank you very much, Victor. It was a pleasure. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.